Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave with a show and tell of a bit of work for hire I did almost 20 years ago now. Wow, that's hard, that's weird. 20 years, okay. Um, so uh, in 2000, I was working for Industrial Light Magic. I had been there for about a year and a half and there was a really cool feature to working at Industrial Light and Magic that I did not realize until I worked there. And that is the moment Industrial Light and Magic went on my resume and was something that I talked about, people who were hiring me to build stuff for them stopped needing to see a portfolio. That was really freaking cool. Like, you know, up until then, I've working out of my little shop on Bartlett Street in the Mission District, I would get a call to, to submit a RFP for work for hire. And frequently, the, the person who was uh, billing the job would say, all right, can we see a portfolio? Can we see the kind of stuff you do? Do you have any recommendations? Or, you know, I, it was always a little bit of a dance you had to do, which is like, that's employment. You always have to kind of sell yourself and talk about your history. But there was a way as a model maker that having Industrial Light and Magic's model shop on your resume just made you like bulletproof. It was a really neat superpower because all of a sudden people would call you up and go, can you build this? And you're like, well, I've been working at Industrial Light and Magic. And they'd be like, great, well, just tell us where to send the dough and we need it by Thursday. Like the transactions became so much easier. Small story to tell you. Um, when I first got to ILM in... Uh, mid-year 1998, they were in full bore production on episode one, 200 plus model makers working. And I had a lot of friends working there, Christine Ells and my mentor, Mitch Romanowski, among many others. And Mitch Romanowski, who I talked about in a recent thing, who ran the shop at James and the Giant Peach a Nightmare Before Christmas, one of the best model makers I've ever worked with. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Um, but Mitch, I got up there, I think, just after Mitch got hired up there. And after about two months, Mitch and I are working at a table next to each other and gluing some parts together for something. And he goes, dude, now that we work at ILM, do you know what that makes us? And I was like, what? And he's like, now we're wizards. Because every time any show or, or preview would talk about Industrial Light and Magic, they would call them the special effects wizards at Industrial Light and Magic. And he was like, now we're the wizards. Okay, that is the longest preamble for a show and tell imaginable. Uh, but in 2000, I was uh, uh, working at ILM, which was not full-time work because there are very few actual staff jobs there. You got work to, to work on a job, often Actually, for the first two or three years I worked there, I never knew if I was going to be working two weeks hence. It was like constant re-upping of my employment, which meant that I still was doing a lot of freelance work, uh, what we call G-jobs, government jobs, gravy jobs, side work, side hustles. Um, and as a model maker, you looked everywhere for side hustles. Uh, Jamie's the first one to teach me that toy prototyping was very lucrative. Uh, I did store window displays. I did theater props. I did film props. And I often built uh, large models of things for trade shows. So at one point, I built a giant... Uh, pair of headphones, Sennheiser headphones, like standard Sennheiser, um, uh, 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 like tech cans, like your basic Sennheisers. I made them big enough to fit, I think a 14 foot tall gold Buddha that we rented uh, for this trade show. And I mean, they had like, they were gorgeous. I can't believe I never took a picture of them because they were beautiful. Uh, and they encompassed some vacuum forming, some laser cutting, some woodwork, some vinyl cutting. Um, and this project I'm about to show you is a similar kind of project. I was uh, reached out to by my friend Dan Kaur, uh, still a good friend. We've been friends since the early 90s. Uh, and Dan was, I think this job came through Dan. Uh, it was a, a, a company called Sonic Box, and they made internet radios. To be honest, I'm not sure about the project itself. I'm not sure about the product itself. But what they wanted was they had this little internet radio, and it was about this big. And they wanted a big model of it to put at their trade show booth. Um, and I built that model. And here it is. This is the model that I built. And this is a, just a terrific, uh, terrific example of exactly the kind of work for hire stuff that I was doing as a young model maker. So uh, 
As you can see, I mean, it's been beat up because it's been traveling around me, traveling around with me shop to shop for 20 years. Um, but it's a fairly refined bit of construction and I'm still really proud of it. Um, and I'll walk you through the construction process. The main body is vacuum formed. Um, the buck that I vacuum formed these, oh, sorry. The main body is vacuum formed and it's vacuum formed in two pieces. There's a back and there's a front. Um, and in order to do this, I had to pull the vacuum form plastic. Vacuum form is a process in which plastic gets heated up until it's soft, and then it gets pulled over a form called a buck and with a vacuum underneath it, and the vacuum sucks the plastic, the soft plastic, onto the buck, uh, and it holds whatever shape uh, your buck was. Now, we all intersect with vacuum forming every single day in toy packaging. The clear stuff that your action figure sits in, that's a vacuum form piece. Um, and it's a fairly refined technology at this point in manufacturing. Um, and Industrial Light and Magic had a vacuum former in their, in their stock, as do I. That should be a show and tell video. I should, or have I already done that? Okay, so I used Industrial Light and Magic, just two by two foot vacuum former to make this. Uh, and the very first thing to do was to get their original product, measure it, and make a CAD design of it. Uh, and the CAD program I used back then was AutoCAD in their 2D because that fed directly into our 24 by, 30, 24 by 48 inch laser cutter we used at ILM at the time. Um, the buck here, the actual form that I pulled the vacuum form over <clears throat> was laser cut. Uh, and that's why I was working in AutoCAD, because I knew I needed the form to be really precise. Uh, and the laser cutter just afforded me to make this as a set of layers. And if you look here up close, you can actually see the remnants of some of those layers. As I cut out like a base piece of acrylic, and then I attached a piece of plywood to that. Again, multiple layers for each step. That's a separate layer, which was rounded and sanded to fit. And then it embeds in this large circle here, which has a kind of a, a radius, a radius sort of long face. And that required me to take those pieces onto the wood lathe and actually face them. And the same thing happened with the volume dial. So with each of these bucks, I made the buck long enough to pull the plastic. What, what happens when you pull the plastic over, like on the edge here, if your buck is here, your plastic comes over and it then webs to the base. So you always want to design your buck so that it, so that your form can actually get to where you want it to before it starts to web. That's non-trivial. Uh, takes some A-B testing and a little bit of experience to figure out what, what height off the buck works for you. But I did this as two separate vacuum form poles. Then um, once I had those poles, uh, and these buttons are all integrated into the pole because I'm using fairly thin plastic. I think this feels like 030 to me, 040. 040 is like my bread and butter. Uh, that's 40 thousandths of an inch thick. Uh, for reference, yeah, it's about the thickness of a paper match, about the thickness of 10 sheets, 50, 10 some odd sheets of regular paper. Um, and I've done enough vacuum forming over the years to know that that would get me the level of detail I wanted on these beautiful buttons. Now, one thing that happens in vacuum forming is you can also end up with webbing on interior details, and that's no good. If I had webbing here, and I did on the first pole, I would have to throw it away. And so the way you deal with webbing on stuff like that is you actually drill tiny holes in the buck, and they allow the vacuum to move up through the buck and suck the plastic into the corners where you want it to go. And if you look closely at my buck, you can see, there we go, you can see those, see these four little... See that little detent? That one, that one. These are all little holes that I drilled to make sure I wouldn't end up with any webbing between these buttons and the side of this front dial. Um, yes, okay, so that's the holes. Oh, you can also see them in another spot I recognize would be critical in between each of these four quarter radius buttons, yeah. So uh, vacuum forming is, a, is, a, is an iterative process. I, I did a pull on this and it didn't work. And so I kept on like modifying the buck until it did. Um, there is the question of this dial here, which as you can see is a lot shinier than the paint job of the other thing. I actually did one of my favorite vacuum form tricks on this, which is this is actually clear PETG that is 
painted on the back. And that gives me this beautiful gloss coat. I actually did the same thing on, oh yeah, the remote control cars from that movie. I will have to do that as a show and tell too. Um, so this is a, um, oh, also all the lettering, all the, the character lettering here from the sonic box to the, that part and all the buttons, these were all vinyl cut on our vinyl cutter at Industrial Light and Magic. One of the great things about that shop, they knew that everyone was doing side hustles. So they actually had uh, costs built in for the laser cutter if it was for a personal job. And you just submitted uh, however many uh, minutes or, or hours you were using the laser cutter for, how, how long the cut was, and then the shop would charge you for it. You'd build that charge into your fee and I mean, it was a wonderful place to work. I mean, not just because it was this resume, uh, it was like this solid gold on your resume, but also because uh, the shop itself under the tutelage of Mark Anderson and later Keith London uh, really engendered keeping its folks employed. So if you weren't working on a job, they were often really cool with you coming in uh, on your off time and making stuff for hire there. It's pretty special. Um, so, like I said, these are all vinyl, these are all cut out vinyl letters that I applied to, to the piece and I had to find bits of vinyl that matched the colors that I wanted. Um, this, this dial here is a piece of vinyl that I cut in reverse so I could stick it to the back of the clear vacuum form and then spray paint around it black. Yeah, I'm really pleased with the effect. Um, and the end result is a super lightweight, I mean, this thing, this whole thing weighs a few ounces. Uh, and yet very robust and good looking uh, product. Um, the reason I still have this is actually a fun story. I reached out to them about five months later because I realized I did not take any pictures of the piece that I built for them. And the guy who hired me was like, yeah, I can get to some pictures, but frankly, we only use it for one trade show. I'll just send you back the prop. And I was like, yeah, brother, that sounds lovely. That's delightful. And so I am able to still have this example of my early work for hire in my collection. Oh, the last bit was getting this color right. So obviously, uh, maybe you don't know this, but uh, every company that has, every company with a logo has very specific colors slated for what that logo's color should be. So these guys supplied me with the Pantone swatch of this specific color of um, highly blue purple or slightly purple blue, however you want to talk about it. Um, and I had the most difficult time, and really the most difficult time matching this color. And I'm this kind of color mixer. I end up with two gallons of the wrong color that's just slightly off that I have to throw away. I, 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 I do this additive process and I always end up mixing way more than I need. So I'm there in the paint room at ILM trying to find a, a flocal that will match and I'm doing these airbrush tests and they're not working. And my friend, the amazing painter and modeler, Melanie Wayless, um, Melanie, uh, fantastic modeler, fantastic painter, um, excellent human being. She would often come to work wearing a fur coat made of the pelts of stuffed animals. One of my favorite Cruella de Vil cosplays I've ever seen. Anyway, Mel was watching me one afternoon after hours trying all these different color tests. And she was like, very gently, like, would you like some help? And I was like, oh yes, please. And she gave me some great guidance, which I actually can't remember at this point, but it was about maintaining, it was about it's about how to get a vibrant color out of a mix because oftentimes when you're mixing paint, you're, you're killing the, the brightness of the primaries and you can get very gray versions of a color that's close, but because it's like, feels slightly grayer or muddier, it's not, uh, it's not working. So Mel gave me this, a bit of advice at that point about what to mix to get this color that turned out to be the perfect advice. And I'm lame now that I went down the road to tell you that story and couldn't remember what the actual advice was. But if I have to hazard a guess as to the advice, I think she was even advising me to kill the intensity of the blue by using its opposite on the color wheel. Uh, she broke out a color wheel and showed me ways in which to think through this problem solving that expanded at that point my ability to mix color. It's been a long time now, so I think I just clearly lost that knowledge base. Um, this is why I often made notes about the things that people told me. Yeah, uh, yeah, 
that, that was definitely a thing that would happen. And I have in some of my old sketchbooks some really cool breakdowns of processes I saw other people using. Um, that's a little trip down memory lane about what it was like to work at ILM back in the day and about the kind of work for hire I would do. Uh, thanks for joining me. This has been a lovely show and tell. Uh, I will see you guys next time. <laughs>